Hello, Inside Great Minds listeners. This is your host, Adam Outland, and we have a really exciting episode that's coming up that we want to make sure you tune in for with Dan Delilah. Dan Delilah is the managing partner at Hoteling Insurance Services. He's had a great career professionally, and he's only in his 30s, so a great to learn from the insurance side, but he's also building an office. So if you're a leader or a manager of a team, there's some really good nuggets to pick on, up on from his trials and tribulations growing into his role. He's also a prior athlete, having played the role of quarterback in college and gone through his failures and successes as an athlete. And I think there's a lot to draw, a lot of reference to take from his time in athletics and how he's applied that to the professional world as well. So uh, come with me and join us in the interview that we have coming up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the 18 million places you can listen to us as well as YouTube. Thanks and look forward to seeing you there. Yeah, this is an incredible story. So a rookie player comes in and just you, you get benched and sidelined. This kid crushes it for a season and yep. you're going to be relegated to the bench. You come in and and during preseason, it's just that that one moment spiked your um, your mindset to just say, I don't I don't give a crap what people think anymore about me. I just need to take charge and, and do it. And yeah. you push through and then have, you know, the best football season of your life. But, you know, Albany makes it, SUNY makes it to the playoffs that year as a result. And so, you know, two things that are in there that I love that are relatable to, to business and life is one, the power of positive competition, right? Like what would have happened had that kid not not come in and disrupted your flow too? And it may not even be positive. And that's the terrible thing, right? So it's like you go back to the military and it's mm -hmm. like, why? generals or commanders come down so hard on Marines because sometimes the best way to tie people together is to give them a common enemy or a person to hate. Yeah. For me, that was the head coach. I hated him with a passion and a fire I never had. And yeah. when he embarrassed me like that after the previous season, knowing that he wanted to cut my scholarship, like yeah. my whole thing was the number one way I could ruin that guy's day is to be wildly successful. Yeah. And and that was the initial spark, was just a pure white hot anger and mm -hmm. hatred that mm -hmm. I then just turned that in. And like, and how many times that happened in life where you where you more so have an adversary or something happens where somebody tells you you can't do it. And that's all the 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 positioning you need to really kind of motivate that. And it eventually turned into a positive self-belief. But yeah. in the beginning, it was motivated by a, oh, yeah, like, screw you mentality. And, and I think, you know, the, the genesis is for some people that works, for some people it doesn't, whatever that initial motivation is. But you go back to uh, like the Jordan documentaries were awesome, where he used to say to fire himself up, he would he would make up stuff that other players would say to him that they never yes. actually. Yeah, had. yeah. I'd say the last <laughs> dance, you'd see that. Yeah, exactly. Right. So like, that's how I felt was like, I would just play this rhetoric in my head to just get myself going, whether it was real or not anymore. It didn't even matter. It just, I knew now what got me into that zone. And I think that's the difference is for the first time I really hit a zone that I never had. And I, and I finally found the, the trigger to get me there. Yeah. Uh, it's powerful to have an enemy. I mean, you're right. And, uh, and it, it can be ironic, but it literally can be your good, someone that you're proving wrong in a way and, and at a certain point it doesn't even become about them anymore it just becomes yeah. a you know what state of mind you're in when you start thinking about something like that and it gets you into the zone like in sports so it's like the same thing like when an actor you know needs to cry they think about something sad but i found my thing that got me into my zone state and I, I hit this mentality standpoint that I've never been in in my life before. I've never been able to access that, or at least not at that level. And once I had the keys to it, it became less about him. But I just I now knew how to get there. Yeah, yeah, you understood. Yeah, you understood what made you tick and how to get the drive going when you needed it. Um, yeah, that's incredible. So we, we move in from you know, college athletics and uh, transition to the professional world. And, and so just real quickly, talk about uh, what you mean when you say uh, you had your proverbial coffee with the Jets. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was there for five seconds. So like, you know, we went through 
Uh, I had the I had the fortunate ability to train at uh, Test Sports, um, yeah. which is a lot of the Jets guys trained in Martinsville. Um, so I knew Bart Scott, Sanchez, threw with them. You know, they, there was like 10 or 12 Jets players that were there. And then uh, it was Rex Ryan was the head coach. Sperano was the offensive coordinator. Um, I got picked up as, you know, a unrestricted free agent, you know, went for the, the mini camp, was there for, you know, like a week or two and then then got cut. Um, so, you know, it wasn't it wasn't really there for, you know, the whole the whole song and the dance didn't go through a season, didn't get red shirted. Uh, or I'm sorry, red shirted, uh, you know, wasn't on the practice squad. Um, so it, it, it kind of ended before it started. Yeah. Um, but, you know, hey, listen, I got to wear a Jets jersey, got to wear a Jets helmet. No, my, dad, my dad was a Jets fan, so he got to see his son in that. Um, and, you know, you're, you're out there competing with, you know, some of the top guys. And, and it was fun to say we did it. Um, but, you know, going into its senior year, like I went home after college football was over and it wasn't until I got a phone, random phone call just in end of December after Christmas from a scout from the Arizona Cardinals. And he's like, you know, who's your agent? I'm like, what? And he's <laughs> like, where are you training? I'm like, training for what? And he's like, you, you're going to give it a shot, right? To like for the NFL, like after that season, I'm like, uh, maybe <laughs> I was like, I, in my head, I was done. Like, yeah. like it, football was over. And then I had to go figure that whole thing out. So I was just happy to be there, like wearing a Jets jersey at that point. Um, and it was just, it was a cool trip. That's awesome. So, so in your head though, like, you know, obviously some people go into it and they're like, oh, yep. You know, NFL has got to be the career, you know, don't have any options for you is almost the opposite in a way, right. Where football was definitely a huge component for you after you started to play and, and went to college for it. But in your head, you, you also had a vision for life after college that wasn't athletic. Yeah. I, I loved, loved, loved football. I loved playing it. Um, mm -hmm. After college was over, I kind of, you know, it had the mental standpoint of I was going to hang it up. That, uh, you know, that stint with like trying for the NFL was awesome. And I was, I was all in when I was all in. And then I was all out when it was over. Like, I just, I didn't want to be that guy that was 27 chasing the dream while working at CVS. And, and that was just, you know, I, I didn't really want to do that of, uh, you know, so many people that get cut. And they have to keep a part-time job while they always wait for their phone to ring. And it's just, it's an anxiety monster. Um, so my thing for me was, you know, coming out of it, I either wanted to be a football coach or I had no idea. Those are only two options. And only reason why I didn't become a coach uh, was because my now wife, uh, Gina, we were dating at the time. I knew it was serious. And I knew that if I became a coach, there's no, she either wasn't going to stay with me or it was going to be brutal because of the coaching world, especially now it's, it's mm -hmm. one, one year wonders, especially yeah. when you're young, you just, Oh, you have a job. You have an upgraded job for me in Montana. Great. I'll be there tomorrow. Um, so you're constantly flying and moving around the country. And I just, I knew that I didn't want to do that to her. Um, and I just worried about what it did with our relationship. And I, to use a football term uh, with her, I outkicked my coverage. So I was not letting her go. Uh, and so I was like, okay, well, let's go find a job. Yeah. 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 So, I, and you're right. I mean, if, especially if you're playing, you know, down here in Texas, you know, uh, what is it? 4A, 5A football. I mean, it's, it's like a, I feel like a hundred hour week gig, right? You're traveling on weekends, evenings, you know, days. So totally get that. What was it in particular that attached you to the, you know, insurance space? And I'll, I'll preface this with, you know, it's, it's actually quite common for high performance athletes to get into some form of consultative sales because yep. in that arena, there's that same ability to compete, to earn on performance, you know, like a lot of the, there's a lot of synergy in athletics and the, the world of business sales. So I get that, but I'm wondering for, for you specifically, what kind of drew you in? Uh, honestly, nothing. I, I had a guy it was a total random series of events. My mom worked at a golf course. Uh, you know, I was always interested in the investment banking, like finance world. Um, so I was thinking about like the whole Wall Street thing. But I, you know, I didn't go to Princeton or, or you know, uh, Harvard or any of these schools. So I didn't really know where to start. And I my mom had a guy at a golf course who was in insurance mm -hmm. and financial advisory. And I remember seeing the car that he drove up in. And then I remember hearing how he took words and tried to tie them into sentences. 
and just sounded like a complete moron. And I'm like, well, if you can drive that car and you do what you do, it's like, if I do what you do, I feel like I could do much better than that. And that was just like, to me, I was like, okay, if, if these are the people that could succeed in this industry, I, why don't I go try out this industry and see what happens? Hmm. And that was how I got into it. Just literally just a, a handshake at a golf course and just kind of sizing somebody up and being like, people give you money and then you put it in the stock market. And really? You? Like, <laughs> oh man. Wow. Okay. Got it. And that, that was how I started. Um, so there was no motivation behind it. It was just literally a series of events and having a, a ability to say, okay, yeah, let's, let's jump and see what happens. Well, you're, you're obviously a very, you know, charismatic, likable guy. Um, but coming back to what you said at, at, you know, your time at SUNY Albany, like, you know, you, you had this deal where, man, I really care what people think, you know, generally that part, that component, when you're, you know, facing rejection, which is just obviously a, a big part of the game, <laughs> you get into the sales consulting space, insurance, financial planning. Um, but, you know, and, and then you had that senior year that obviously contributed to like being able to set that aside and pursue a performance. But what, Talk about that a little bit. Like, what, what were some of the early challenges getting started um, in the industry? Well, I mean, I think you know when you when you think about it, you're, to your point, it's it's not even rejection. I just think as a whole, it's dealing with adversity, right? Mm -hmm. So, to use the example of football, and and you know, I hire most of my team as ex athletes, and and I agree with you that I think it, it goes beyond just sales. I think it just goes to when you have people that have sports, there there are some intangibles where they're they're used to losing. Yes. Right. That, that's your equation with rejection. You, you go back to football, right? It's like it's easy to show up for a 6 a.m. workout and then practice in the afternoon when you're 10 and 0. How is it when you're two and eight and it's 15 degrees outside? And you're not playing. Right. That's different. That takes a different mental mindset to keep that discipline, to keep that edge. The other thing that people don't realize about sports and athletics is the discipline is the regiment. Hmm. So in college, it was Monday, you know, wake up, film review, workout, class, lunch, practice, class, that, every day, scheduled, regimented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what you start to realize is, and one thing that I love and uh, what I believe Jocko uh, Willick said this in his book, um, discipline equals freedom. Mm -hmm. And when you're disciplined and you have a regiment that then allows you to free up other places because you meet people that just, they run around crazy all the time. And, and in that case, you're really having a lot of things control you. And there's so many variables in the world control the things that you can control because there'll be plenty of variability out there. But if you let the chaos come to you, you will forever be steered by it. For me, I'm a big believer in create your own chaos. Yeah. And that's how I look at it is like, I, I want to say, okay, I'm going to be disciplined in this stuff because then when that chaos comes and knocks on my door, I'm prepared to give it right back. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've really kind of viewed things. And I think football really taught me that of, of having a process, having a procedure, having efficiencies, because, you know, Monday through Friday for a lot of people, like it, it's very redundant right? For most people. So how do you continue to enhance yourself? Well, you already know that you're going to have redundancies. You're going to, you already know you're going to have things that are happening consistently. Well, how do you continue to make that more efficient? And the only way to do that is to be disciplined, to have a regimen and follow a process and procedure that you're always working to improve on. And I think you look at the same thing in practice, like football 50 years ago is very different than it is today. Even just the practice style, the format, the plays, they're always looking for that edge. How do you get that little incremental edge? How do we run more plays in practice? How do we get in and out? How do we get out of cuts at a millisecond quicker? Same yeah. thing applies to business. And, and you could really marry those two things, but the fundamental pieces, the foundational pieces never change. Yeah, uh, so true. So, so talk, talk to me a little bit, you know, what were some of the early challenges in building this business um, that you ran into? I mean, reflective of, of the, the football years, what were some of those early stumbling blocks or walls that you ran into uh, uh, on the beginning? Because, you know, I think inside great minds, we meet 
all these people who have had pretty spectacular careers, um, but, uh, uh, you know, very few of them have ever got there uh, easily. There's always some some roadblocks that they had to get through. If they did, it wouldn't be a good story. Nobody wants to hear the story of, like, you were born on third base and you scored a home run. That's right. It's, it's, yeah. You know, so so that's where, you know, you're, to your point, the challenging part is, you know, these fundamental pieces, but then how do you apply it? Yeah. Where do you even go? Right. Especially when if you don't have a key mentor, are you following the example from somebody bad? So so when I was at MetLife, it was like, study this book and then cold call 300 people a day and go sling some rock. And and it's like, you know, go pitch this product. And yeah. I was there, I was at MetLife for nine months. And then, and then, you know, you're learning from people that you're looking at them and going, like, if I saw you on the street, like, I would never want to talk to you. Like, you look sleazy or like, there's no way. Or you see their production numbers because, you know, at those big institutions, they have all the sales numbers out there. And it's like, you're teaching me, but you're earning minimum wage. <laughs> right. Been here seven years. Like, why, why am I listening to you? That's like having like a 300 pound nutritionist. <laughs> so so like you know for me like i just it wasn't lining up and then when i joined hoteling my partner bobby hoteling who was a senior guy well that was the mentor i needed so the first thing i would say the first challenge is finding a mentor finding somebody that you can aspire to and that you could follow in their footsteps and i think that's one thing that people can always do is like everybody wants to go out and like trailblaze and like recreate the world and like you're not that special. You're most people are not going to be Steve Jobs uh, initially, and even him, he couldn't code. It's not like he was like. Brrr. There was a lot of people around there. So for me, I'm a big believer in R and D, which is rip off and duplicate. So go find somebody that's doing what you're doing, or where you want to be, and then try and emulate them. Mm. Spend those first couple of years following in their footsteps and doing what they do not trying to go figure it out yourself. Cause that for me was the biggest challenge was trying to figure out this whole unknown course, just to say, I did it myself versus just finding somebody that's done it and say, okay, what are steps? One, two, three, four, five, six. Again, you're successful. I'm just going to do what you do or at and least start. It, and we didn't talk too much about this, but it sounds like that was also a lesson learned um, on the football field a little bit, you'd mentioned that your quarterback coach was the one who yeah. advocated for you, right? Um, did, did you kind of feel like that was maybe the equivalent of Bobby a little bit in your college years? Yeah, ha have somebody whose opinion you respect. Mm. Because if you don't respect their opinion, you shouldn't be listening to them anyway. Yeah. Whether they're right or wrong, you're just not going to hear the information in the way that you need to. They might be telling you all the right things, but if you don't have that kind of bond or connection with them, you're mentally not going to be in the right place to absorb the information and, and act on it. So you need to find somebody who you actually respect and, and can be akin to, because then you'll find yourself in the right mental space to learn from them and, and be able to move forward. Um, and, and I think, yeah, like in college, like I always, I always got along well with whoever my offensive coordinator and quarterback coach was in high school was a guy by the name of coach Cardi in college. It was this guy, Ryan McCarthy, and then it became Bobby. So I always kind of looked at who that mentor is. And if I look at like Ryan McCarthy, he was the most regimented guy I've ever met still to this day. I mean, every 10 minutes of his life was scheduled, but it allowed him to get so much done during the day. And then I took the 60, 70% of that I liked. And then I made the other 30% my own. Mm. I did the same thing with Bobby. When I first started, you know, you don't know where to go a lot of times when you're first starting. And, and we're like conditioned, like as kids, like, especially my generation, like you're so special. The whole world's going to come to you. Everything is going to be amazing, sweetie. And then you get there and you're like, is this the moment that I'm supposed to know what the hell I'm doing? Or is that, is that still coming? Cause I haven't figured it out yet. And people just stand there and they don't do anything. Well, go find somebody that you could emulate what they're doing. Check your hubris a little bit and go learn from them. Mm -hmm. And once you kind of get those steps going, you figure it out. And do, were you, uh, do you ever remember a movie finding Forrester? Oh yeah. Which, yeah. So in that, and this is a, a great, I, I don't know why this just drilled in my head, but, the, the kid, Robert Brown, who's actually a client of ours, 
he was right. They used, he was this writer, right. That played basketball and he used to have, and Sean Connery was this like recluse writer. And he used to say, you're a talented writer, but he never knew where to start. So what Sean Connery would say is start copying the first four or five pages of my story just Mm -hmm. to get you going and then finish it your own way. And that always just resonated with me for some weird reason. Mm -hmm. I always thought of like, okay, I'm going to start my story by using somebody else's story and copy that. And once I start getting into a flow, then I'm going to go do my own thing. Mm -hmm. And, and that was how I really did things with Bobby was I saw how he approached it. I was like, I like that. I like that. I like that. Mm, That's not going to work for me. And, and that's how I started down that path. Love that. Um, you know, I think that we'll call it the finding Forrester principle, right? You <laughs> piggyback on uh, the kind of the story someone else has written who's had success and and then grow it um, based on how you emulate them. I love it. Yeah. If you're, if you're just trying to figure it out yourself, especially if it's if it's an industry that's been around for a long time, like why? Yeah. Like, yeah, trying to go invent something. Yeah, you, you kind of got to figure it out yourself. But if it's something that's been around and there's people that are successful that you can go, you know, spend some time with, go do it, go do it. It's okay to not know everything, especially when you're new. Yeah. So, so let's, I'm going to fast forward here towards kind yeah. of like the, the, the recent days. So um, building your career in New York city and, um, and then you're asked uh, after doing some uh, flights back and forth from New York City to Houston, where you've been building some advisor relationships, some kind of building your base of of clients and, and relationships down here and in Beaumont, right? Yep. Uh, I know yeah. I'm- New York City to that. Beaumont, very normal. <laughs> yeah, Beaumont and, and Houston. And, and then uh, eventually you're asked to just kind of plant roots in Houston to really build was that, was that like Bobby that asked you or you, you self-nominated that? This was all right. Yeah. This was my okay. idea. I, uh, I came home one day and like, and things were sizzling in New York and we were getting some good traction in Houston, but I was like, I was a New York guy. Like I wanted the penthouse in New York city overlooking central park, you know, sipping a martini and just toasting, you know, conquering the world type stuff. Um, and I just came home one day and my wife looked at me and was like, you know, she's like, what, what's wrong? Like, you feel like you've been in outer space for the last like two months or two weeks. And I'm like, I don't even want to say it out loud. I was like, cause you're going to hate me. I was like, but, and she, you know, just pried me. And I go, I, I think we should move to Houston and open up a business there. And she's like, are you kidding me? She's like, you've always wanted to do this here. Like, you know, we're building, like you just got named partner. Like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know, like just my, my gut is just yanking me there. And I don't know why. And, and I've always, I, I am a total gut guy, total mm-hmm. gut. I do not listen to my head. I, I, I've made most of my decisions in life by flipping a coin, yeah. not to care if it's heads or tails, but just to know what my reaction is. So if yeah. I say you know, heads is yes, tails is no, and I flip it, and I my I see heads, and my first thought is I want to flip it again. Yeah, my gut knows that I really wanted to say no. Yeah, and that's how I've made my entire life decisions. Um, most of my big life decisions, and and that's that just kind of yanked me, and I laid that whole thing on her. She took about like two three seconds, caught her breath, and she goes, you know, do you think we could? You think you could really build it there? And do you think this is the best choice for our family? And I go, yeah. And she goes, all right, let's move. It's just like that. Wow. And I called a meeting on a Saturday with my partner, Bobby, and told him what I wanted to do. Uh, and he was like, you know, I think he was a little nervous that I was just going to go start something by myself. Uh, but I told him, I was like, no, listen, like, I'm going to go build a whole nother thing in another city, which we had never done before as a firm. Like, we were always a New York firm. Mm. Uh, and I was like, you know, I want you to, I want to be the partner on this with you and I, I want to do it together, but like, I'm, I'm going to go do this. And it wasn't like really a request. It was more of like, here's what we're going to do. Yeah. So j- jumping in as, uh, as quarterback again and taking, taking ownership. Yeah. Yeah. And it was very terrifying, but uh, <laughs> it was the right move. 
Well, yeah, obviously you built a really great practice here, but yeah, it is terrifying, right? Because while you have a little bit of a support network from New York and, and it's not your first rodeo doing the job itself, there's a whole new part of the job that you were exposed to, which is, um, I'm assuming here, and actually you can correct me if I'm wrong, because maybe you were doing this in New York, but where you're you're transitioning a little bit, where you're still on the production side, I mean, you're still front facing with clients growing and, and being in the trenches, but now you're also... To grow an office means you've got to step even more into the leadership role, yep. uh, recruit, train, onboard, develop uh, a, an organization, right? Yeah, you know, had I, you done that? I'm doing that in New York. I, I was just a, I was the young hotshot producer uh, yeah. that some days my head fit through the door, some days it didn't. Uh, and just was, you know, the one going out in the city in, in my late 20s. I actually was like so excited to turn 30 just so I could stop telling people I was 29 because they always used to ask how old I was. Yeah. Um, so the day I turned 30, I was ecstatic. Uh, and, you know, but that was that was my thing was like in New York, it was just producing. And then I had to come down here and really mature to figure out how to run a business and, and how to, you know, deal with people and how to inspire, you know, people around us. And it goes back to like, again, you know, now you're now you're a team. And you have to build and inspire the team and deal with the trials and tribulations of a team. Um, and we had the New York infrastructure, uh, you know, which really supported us as, as the backbone. But like I came down here and, you know, by myself, Bobby visits, you know, a couple times a year tops. Um, but I, I didn't know, you know, a soul in Houston. And first step was like, go find an assistant. Then second step was go find other producers. Then go find somebody that can work on you. Know, it was just bite after bite after bite while simultaneously producing and, you know, really kind of generating, generating the revenue of the company and then trying to crack into a, you know, the fourth largest city in the world after working in the first largest, or I'm sorry, fourth largest city in the country after, you know, being in the first largest city in the country. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, building a, a really successful practice in Houston um, again, it, you know, you're, you're exercising you're recruiting, and developing team members is still definitely related to consulting and selling skills in the sense that, you know, you're selling a vision, you're selling, uh, come, come here, this is where we're going to grow this thing together, right? So there is translation of skill, but it is a new muscle, right, to lead and manage people. So what were some of the early lessons or maybe lessons that, that are still evolving for you in, in that seat? What, what were some of the early challenges or lessons that you've picked up on the, the developing an office? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the different personalities and the different ways that you have to treat people, um, especially coming from like the Northeast coming down to Texas, it's a very different mentality. Um, and sometimes that New York City horsepower can come off as a little abrasive. And, and I certainly am, you know, I'm, I'm an intense guy. Uh, that's just that's just how I am. I'm high energy. I'm intense. I, I'm going to give 130 percent every single day. And sometimes I don't understand why nobody else is on that wavelength. Yeah, pause um, here for just one second. Um, yeah. What do you think it means when someone says, bless your heart? <laughs> oh, yeah, no. I learned that out real quick that, that like, that's not a good thing. <laughs> I figured that, oh, bless your heart. And I'm like, oh, man, they, they just basically said I'm a moron. Shit. <laughs> I, I did not realize what that meant. Now, now I got it. Yeah. Uh, I, had to get the, I had to get the translation going real quick. <laughs> Um, cultural change down here and adapting to that, but but I like what you're. Sorry to interrupt. What you were sharing okay. about that, which is, you know, we we have a principle in our company of where you're, you know, a lot of people have heard the golden rule: treat others the way you want to be treated, right? And that's great for most people. Um, as you get into leadership, or honestly, even if you're in sales, I think what you learn is that not everybody's like you, and so if you think yeah. treating people like you want to be treated is going to work great you end up learning otherwise. And we, we jokingly call it the platinum rule, which is treating others the way they want to be treated. Yeah. Right? And, and I think but, the way that we looked at it was more, and this is, you know, a lesson learned to your point. It was, it was, you know, at the, in the beginning, it was like who, who we hired that could fit the role that was willing to work with uh, at that time, a 30 year old who was saying he wanted to go take on the insurance brokerage space in Houston and people are looking at me and going, hoteling, ha ha like, who, who are you guys? <laughs> like, like you're, it's just you? You're, you're subletting a broom closet from an attorney and you want me to come work for you? Like, what are you talking about? Can you even pay me? 
like, you know, so, so that was really kind of the getting over that hump. And then, you know, walking in at the family offices and the accounting firms, I'm like, yeah, like, no, I'm, I'm going to be, I want to be the guy moving forward. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like I've had a relationship for 20 years. So, uh-huh. so I think that is less about, like you said, um, treating people the way you want to be treated and more about hiring the people that represent the core values that you want to have. And, and that's what I've learned is you have to surround yourself with people that have the same values as you. They don't have to be the best because, you know, you think about going back to sports, you could have the best player, but there are cancer in the locker room. You have NBA teams that they are the highest, they have the highest score in the league, but they're 500 when they're playing. And then all of a sudden the guy gets hurt and all of a sudden they're winning 70, 80% of their games. Well, that shouldn't happen technically, but you just don't know what that person's doing to affect the other players. You can have a really good person in your organization who's your top salesperson, but they're a terrorist. And when you focus on values and surround and whatever your values are, like everybody has different values, but like for me, like our values were win. Mm-hmm. That was, I wanted people that had a winning mentality. Mm-hmm. I wanted people that we called it grit, grind and bind, which meant like we are going to have some grit. We're going to be mentally tough, but we're going to focus on like closing business, um, do things the right way making sure that you're always continuously doing things the right way. You're always representing people the right way. You're always being honest and telling the truth. Extreme ownership, Mm -hmm. being accountable. You know, if you make the mistake, do not dish that out on somebody else. Like it's always your fault. And if you internalize that, it flows from the top all the way down. If somebody screws up, well, I, Dan, I didn't give you the best instructions. I could have been clear. If you always accept responsibility and hold yourself accountable more than anybody else, you'll always have other people that will be willing to be accountable as well. And when you clearly communicate those values and you focus on people's intangibles like that, you can, you don't look at talent anymore. You focus on, is this person going to be a culture fit? Is this person going to represent our values? And that's how I hire. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. And so then you have a, and that's what, what develops into a culture, right? A culture is supported by values. Uh, love that. So, you know, you, you found um, people who share the same values with you uh, by articulating yourself first, what those values were trying to put them on paper and write them down. And, uh, and, and honestly, I, I love all the lessons that kind of relate back to the values. And it's, it's neat that we can see where some of those came from for, for you personally too, right? from uh uh i i think where you picked up that that rewriting of your own narrative in college when your your coach pissed you off so much that you you had this enemy and while some and many people do take a moment where someone stops believing in them or they feel a lack of belief from someone and they they just write that in as like okay maybe this isn't what i'm supposed to do it's a real easy answer you developed a skill of being able to write, rewrite the narrative of like, this is the reason I'm that person wrong. Like that Michael Jordan concept. Of, and, it, and it became, and I think too, as I got older, it became even more elevated in the sense of like, you're not proving them wrong anymore. That might be the initial spark, but what you're really doing is you're proving yourself right. Yeah. Yeah. You're proving yourself right, but you're using them to give you that first step. But yeah. eventually they disappear because they no longer matter anymore. And the only one that matters is you. And all you're doing is vindicating your own belief. hundred percent. So that, that matures. And then, uh, and, and then, you know, not, not letting how you care about how people perceive you get in the way of your focus on a goal. Right. So those kind of contributing to that win attitude. Um, and then the, I, I really like the mentorship piece too. I mean, finding people to emulate as a, as a, a key and that finding Forrester uh, principle that will coin <laughs> this podcast as a cool concept about how to do that um, using someone else's story. So this has been great. I I guess in just in quick summary, kind of a lightning round of a few questions that I have for you Uh, book, like recent book that you've read um, or if you're more of like a listen guy that you've listened to that has been helpful for you in business. 
Um, I think Tim Grover's Relentless is one of my favorite. Um, he was the uh, trainer for Michael Jordan. I think, uh, I think he does a great job. Um, he also has a book called Winning. I, I I'm a, I like audio books. I like to read like paper. I like to actually read books for like pleasure, like a epic fantasy or like something like that. <laughs> but if I'm trying to learn, I like to listen because I'll do like cardio or I'm, I'm psychotic yeah. work out at the gym, just like listening to an audio book. My wife thinks I'm crazy. Um, but, you know, you get to spend a lot of time listening to people and it goes back to the mentorship, right? Like it always, it always fascinated me that You'd, you'd have some of the most successful people in the world that spend months writing down all their life lessons and then nobody takes three hours of their time to hear it. Like, what? <laughs> so so I, I think he's really good. And then um, this is another one. Uh, it's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Oh, yeah. Uh, phenomenal book of kind of how you change and shape yourself. And my favorite lesson from there is uh, the pursuit of life should not be avoiding pain the pursuit of life should be focusing on what you are willing to suffer for and what problems you're willing to have because if you try and remove pain and remove problems in your life you'll never get there it's always like oh if i if i buy a new car then i'll be happy or if i do this then i'll be happy well inherently that means you're not happy right now but if you focus on these are the problems or these are the challenges I choose to face today and I'm going to enjoy that, you will get a lot more out of life. And the way he talks about this is he goes, you know, a homeless person has money problems and Warren Buffett has money problems. Warren Buffett just has much better money problems. And and that's what you focus on is like I, I want to choose to have better problems in my life not the removal of problems because that's impossible and it will always lead to me being unhappy. And I think that is something that is very apropos for today's day and age. Yeah. Love it. Um, most uh, utilized app, like from a, like a functional, like Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. Twitter. Twitter. Okay. Twitter. I mean, yeah, it's it, the Elon Musk thing. It's modern, it's modern day news. It's, it's how you see what's going on in the world. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm an economy nerd, so I love to like get like the quick feeds on everything economy. But I think mainstream media is just brutally bad. Um, so anytime that you know I want to try and get information that is not following the beaten path, uh, I think that's a great news source to follow the right people. I, I don't really like you know go down like the institute, like any of like the fluffy stuff. I use it more as like my new what the New York Times used to be 20, 30 years ago, or the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, got it. Love it. And then, um, yeah, just in summary, what anything that we, you know, maybe didn't cover that you you want, you know, our listeners to hear, where, where can they find, follow you um, and hear your, your wisdom uh, more frequently? Uh, I mean, I, I'll do some stuff on LinkedIn or, or you'll see me out. I don't really uh, post a ton on like social media or anything like that. What about Twitter? Do you post uh, them? I post Twitter. I just use it to read. <laughs> Okay, I, that's my news sources. I'm a, I uh, not not a big fan of throwing stuff up on social anymore. <laughs> um, but you know, I think uh, I would just say that for any of the people out there that are that are entrepreneurs or, or you know working and coming up, like it's supposed to be a struggle. Like it's it would be a real like we said before, it would be a really boring story if just everything in your life went the right way and it was successful. No one would want to hear about it. And you learn a lot more out of the things that go bad in your life than you do from the things that'll go good. And, and that's just kind of my, my thing is, you know, carry your own chip on your shoulder. If you don't have a chip, make one up, find the thing that really kind of inspires you and be willing to be a little bit vulnerable, be willing to, you know, try and, and bet on yourself. Um, because in, in my opinion, like, you know, putting all the chips in the middle and, and betting on yourself is, is the best way to get anything out of life. Um, if you really want to have something that's meaningful, but you have to be willing to take some risk and, and, but that's really kind of what it's all about. Right. Yeah. I love that. That was a great way to bring it home. Um, thanks for the time. This has been a great interview. My pleasure, man. I, I was excited to do this and, uh, thanks for having me on.